Hello and welcome to First Thoughts. I'm Connor Izagari. I'm Carol Luce. And today we are discussing our initial thoughts on the recent action blockbuster Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. A exciting first half of a epic conclusion to Tom Cruise's signature franchise. And uh, quite an entertaining film, a good change of pace from what has been a pretty lackluster year for the most part. Uh, but even so, on a $300 million budget, this thing is likely not going to make its money back at least as fast as everyone had hoped. And, you know, blame that on the ongoing writer's strike, which is now a writer's actor strike, or blame it on a relatively slow, underwhelming year of film. Whatever the cause, there's really no such thing as a surefire blockbuster anymore, <laughs> which is interesting times to live in. I never thought I'd see that. Some films you can just assume like, oh, of course, that'll make a billion dollars. That is no longer the case. Yeah, I I think it's a lot. I think it's I think it's a lot of fact. I don't think we can narrow it down to one single factor. I think it's a lot of factors. I think it's a it's a mixture of like you said, people being mostly underwhelmed with the the summer release schedule this year. Um, it being a packed summer release schedule. I mean, there's these past couple of months I've been at theater. I know, and this is I mean, granted, it's because I know we're a bunch of movie buffs. But I've been at theater almost every damn weekend. Um, yeah. seeing a new release movie. Obviously, that's not everyone. They got to pick and choose what they see. So sometimes they're like, "Yeah, we can't watch that yet. We'll just wait for streaming." Um, it could be that. It could be the fact that I've heard this complaint for years now of why are these run times getting so ridiculously long? Like, not everyone. Sorry, James Cameron, with your dumb comment when Avatar Two was coming out. For those who don't know, his whole comment about like people watch like can watch like five hours of tv at home then go so i'm like well yeah they're home they're comfortable that's not sitting in your spot three hours dealing with other people in a movie theater it's a whole different thing i'm surprised he didn't just tell people like all you got to do is bring a catheter and a piss bag and you'll be fine yeah and also i want to say it way of water sucked i don't get the hype so on that note um But, you know, these insanely long run times, I mean, the one we're talking about, while still good, and I'm going to be very positive about it myself, I know you will too, it's two hours and 43 fucking minutes long. I mean, Jesus Christ. Um, So long run times and insanely high budgets. Like, you cannot, we're past the point where you can slap on a 300, I mean, the fact that, like, this is one of the most expensive films ever made about 291 million dollars and coming off a film also one of the most expensive films made in the new indiana jones at 300 million and shockingly enough you're seeing at first people were like you know i know you you said a lot of people said the same thing of like well any it wasn't bound to make it back because people didn't really like it it had a lukewarm response explain this one like it has a for those who care i i don't but as 96 percent of ron's tomatoes it is getting critical acclaim it is getting praise from audiences and it's and it opened on a Wednesday, so they kind of give them some more time. It's still technically underperformed because of its budget. So it's like I think it's a whole mixture of factors that, and it looks like since Hollywood shutting down, hopefully these once they get their head out of their asses with you know paying the writers and actors what they are worth, they can start relooking at like the movies and how they need to do it. And stop with these long run times. Stop with these insanely high budgets. Like, look at the films that become surprise successes. Um, we were talking about before the recording, but apparently Elemental shot up secretly, and it's probably what an hour and a half, hour forty minutes tops. Um, I been Insidious: The Red Door made an, an extra one hundred million this weekend. It's under two hours long. Um, some of the biggest animated hits of the year: Spider Man Cross Spider Verse and Super Mario, both. Well, okay, Spyro Cross was over two hours, but Mario was an hour and a half. It's one that in, was one of the most insanely huge hits of the year. So, like, it's interesting to me that a lot of the hits are movies that people like, but also have short run times. 
I think that's definitely a factor. You know, people's attention spans are not what they used to be. But you know what else is also not what it used to be? Ticket prices. I have the Alamo Draft House season pass, which means I pay a $2 service fee on the app and I get to see, I get to purchase at least up to uh, two, two tickets a day. That's how I, you know, but that's 20 bucks a month. It makes its money back quickly. But I'm on the app right now. And if I wanted to buy a ticket to Mission Impossible tonight, $13.50. Hmm? Movies used to be accessible to everybody. The term Nickelodeon, you know, the, the channel with SpongeBob, that comes from a nickel like fee to go see a movie. Five cents to go watch a, a picture. That has evolved into a luxury. Now, seeing a movie is not something everybody can afford to do all the time. And when you've got, you know, wages not increasing and inflation just getting worse and these budgets are ballooning and movie ticket prices are getting bigger and bigger, you're going to see a sharp decline. So either we need to get paid more or movies need to cost less, but both are going in the opposite direction and it's just going to get worse. Yeah, like uh, it's like I said, now with um, add that with streaming, right? Like a lot of stuff mm. doesn't take long to hit streaming. So people look at those ticket prices, especially if you have a family and you're trying to plan like an outing, those ticket prices go up dramatically when it's a group of people. So like, you know, why should I see Scream 6 in theaters when, hey, it's a Paramount movie. If I wait long enough, it hits Paramount Plus. I save myself money and miles when I'm paying for a streaming. It is that, yeah, you know, I, that's what I said about Elemental. You know, I was going to see it, and then I I had the thought, like, well, it'll be on Disney Plus in a month. Like, what's my hurry? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, you know, I with that, you know, I, I'm contributing to the whole, you know, decline of theater culture, which sucks. But, you know, Hollywood's pretty much done this to themselves. You know, when you give everyone a crazy amount of access to so much content, it makes, you know, that you can just get from your home it makes driving to a movie theater, sitting next to strangers, ordering super expensive food that's not usually that good. It makes it all seem a lot less worth the hassle. And that, that's why I'm talking. <laughs> Excuse me. That's why I'm talking about the people you do with theaters. You know, that's been a long running thing that a lot, of, a lot of you know movie goers are much more respectful for getting tired of and don't want to deal with. You say it a lot of time, people complaining about it. The people that are on their phones and not. And won't shut up. And now I've been hearing more and more reports of like, you know, teenagers and colleges going in and just pulling their phones out for TikTok selfies and or sorry, Snapchat selfies and TikTok videos. I just sound like an old man saying a fucking TikTok selfie. Jesus. Um getting on the TikTok and they're snapping their selfies and they're (laughs) God damn it. But you know, they're getting on like social media and stuff, and it's like that turns a lot of people off because it's like, why go and deal with that? Like I'm of the mindset that, Hey, you pay to see the film. It's okay to unplug. It's fine to unplug and just watch the movie. The world will move on after the movie's over. Um, Well, that's why I do love the Alamo draft house because they do fight that shit really hard. And I do like that. But like a few years ago, um, I was in New York city and I went to see X-Men apocalypse. First off, it was like a $30 ticket because it's New York city. (laughs) I know. And the entire fucking room was talking the entire time. Like there was, I could barely hear the movie. No one gave a shit. I don't, I don't understand that. Like the theater experience used to be something that mattered. People, you know, I know it's going to sound like, you know, cliche, but like people wore suits. God damn it. Like that was a night out. (laughs) People cared. People had some class. What happened to all of our class? (laughs) We stopped caring. We I'm never running a suit. I'm never running a suit to movie theater, but I think it's I think it's a I yeah no I I think it's a lot of factors that have added up. Um, because yeah, like you, you know, I got I'm like two minutes away from the Cinemark, um, so I got their thing where I get like a free sometimes two because they roll over, uh, movie movie tickets a month. So at least like let's say I'm seeing four movies in one month, at least one or two of them are essentially free. Then I'm just paying for the other ones, which helps you know lessen the cost. Um, but yeah, not everyone does that, and there's plenty of big release films, usually for other reasons involving the directors and their mounts and how they treat an audience. That I've been like, mm, I'll 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 wait for streaming 
Uh, I'm looking at you, Avatar Way of Water and Top Gun Maverick. You know, it's real. Did you see the like incredibly arrogant trailer for Oppenheimer at uh, Oh yeah, Mission Impossible? Where it's like just one week. You're not gonna fucking believe it. Like I've never seen a movie trailer where it's like counting down, like it's almost here. I've never seen that. Like, yeah. like Jesus, Chris. And it's funny because I just realized like Universal's the one releasing this film, mm-hmm. and they're the ones with Peacock. So Nolan can complain about Max all he wants, but his phone's going to end up on the cock, and by the end of the year. <laughs> just goes to show, all- you know, if all you do is complain, and you know, just turn cinema into some kind of a you know race for your own ego you're just gonna end up on the cock just like everybody else yep and speaking of the cock um this won't make a lot of sense because we are recording this uh fun little project way in advance and the episodes won't come out to the end but i did see confirmation that killian murphy hangs dong in Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer, and that's one of the reasons it's rated r I what why? why? <laughs> it's a I biopic of Robert Oppenheimer. Like why why do we need to see his dick? I don't I can't know. imagine any scenario where we need to see his dick. I feel like that was killing both of me. Like I need to show this and show that I still got it. <laughs> I mean, okay, I'm sure I, I want to know the context. I, I hope it's not just, you know, he's like working late at night, just completely naked, like building the bomb, like Eureka. I've I think I've that I think that'd be hilarious. Apparently, it has to do with like scenes involving Florence Pugh because she plays like a, it's like mistress or whatever. So I, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I just really hope it's not you know, it's not his. It's not self indulgent and arrogant and like I really hope that it's there's some substance here. Yes, yeah. I'm I'm hoping he can go back to like his like Dark Knight trilogy, Inception, um, the Prestige, uh, Memento days. And rein in some of his more um the more uh, bad tendencies I've been coming forward, like with yes, overcomplicated storylines and avant-garde. Avant-garde. Thank you. Oh yeah, I'm not god, my bad. But oh but um that and um his insistence to have music overshadow dialogue um throughout his movies. I'm hoping some of those are like dialed down. Because it, it's a very interesting story he's telling for sure. Like that's a very like interesting time in our history. That I'm I'm, I'm going to watch the movie. I'm not seeing it in theaters. I'm, I'm going to watch it later when it's on the cock. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'm hoping he can rein in some of his more um, not so great tendencies in his like later projects I've seen. Yeah, me too. I mean, I've enjoyed all of his movies. I I think Ten. It's the one I I like the least. But even that, I I. I find it watchable. For me, it was Dunkirk. I'm I'm glad you guys liked it, but I fucking despise that movie. I hated it so much. It was so fucking boring to me. I just I knew the story, and I've always found that that the story of the Battle of Dunkirk pretty fascinating. That like England England sent its civilians to go save its soldiers. I just I love that story. So I was into the, I was into it. I liked I I appreciate what you're trying to do with like not really having a main character, just pretty much telling a factual story. Yeah. But I was so goddamn bored. Because I'm like, I have no one to root for. I'm just watching scenes that I don't care. You can't hear Tom Hardy throughout the goddamn movie. I'm talking. He's talking. And I'm like, I. It's muffled, dude. Fucking fix your dialogue. I think that's just Tom Hardy. I mean, that's what he. That's what he does. He mumbles quietly to himself. Ah, <laughs> uh, well. Anyway, I'm. Yeah. Obviously, you know, I and a guest will be discussing Oppenheimer next week. It will not be him. <laughs> it won't be me. <laughs> uh, okay, Mission Impossible. So, are you a, like a like? When did you discover this franchise? Is this something you grew up with, or something you found I, I, down the road? I down the road. I got into it late. Um, by the time I got into this in, into this series, Rogue Nation was out. By the time I got into it, so they were what five films deep at that point. No. Um, it was one of those I heard about. You know, all my life. You know. People talking about, oh, if you, you know, if there's any Tom Cruise one, you have to see those. It's like, you know, it's always the ones that get talked about the most up there, like Top Gun and stuff. But because of experiences watching other t- highly rated Tom Cruise films that I found overrated, aka Top Gun, I was like, oh, I don't know. Like, so far, I've checked out some of this, like, stuff that you guys love, and I'm just not that into it. 
And it has something to do with my look. Moving forward on this, nothing about this has to do with his damn personal life. Even though I'm not the hugest fan, I'm talking purely film here, okay? Yeah, let's Actors. let's make it statement that right now. Like as a human being, Tom Cruise is questionable and there's a lot of dark shit going on there. We're not going to bring that up. This is about Mission Impossible. This is about his career, his movies, separate entities, man and art. Everybody got that. Yes, I just want to put that out there real quick. So I know I made some comments, but I'm just really talking about him as an actor in his movies. Um, but one day I was looking for something again. I was like, you know what? Let me just let me give just give it a shot. Let me just finally sit down and give these films a shot. And like I said, it was like it was after I think Rogue Nation had hit home video side so access. I was able to be able to find a way to access all you know five movies at the time. And I remember for the first three movies, I was like, okay, these are like. I was falling into that trap. I was like, these are good, but like, why are people raving about like, they're fine. They're fun. You know, um, the first one is, you know, it's just not my most favorite De Palma directed film, but it's still pretty good. De Palma directed film, uh, you know, two, I thought it was an interesting mixture of John Woo and mission Impossible. It's an interesting film. <laughs> um, and then the third one was like definitely a JJ Abrams movie. Definitely that. Um, I did like uh Philip Seymour Hoffman a lot as the villain in the third one. Um, but yeah, I was saying, going, okay, these are, you know, not the best thing or not the worst. And then when I put the fourth one on the, the Brad Bird directed one ghost protocol, that's when it, and I got it. And that's when it clicks and I got it. And I went, okay, I'm getting like, to me, four honors when this series just finally put a fucking pedal to the metal and went, you know, went to the races. Um, and I was, I was like, damn, this is good. I really like this one. Like from the, the tower scene to the explosion that he's running, like it was, I was clicking on that one. And then I watched Rogue Nation. I was like, fuck, this one's good. Holy shit. And then, you know, by that point I'd missed due to like, uh, being on my CD time at that time, just like deployment or stuff. I'd miss Fallout's theatrical release, but when I was briefly in San Diego for a time period, going to, um, a school for my job I have now. Um, it was on Prime, so I rented it and I watched Fallout. I was like, God damn, okay. Although, like, you know what? Next one that comes out, I'm seeing there because I'm just really enjoying these like later entries. So, yeah, I'm I'm late to it, but my overall friend is like, Yeah, the first three are fine. I can watch them, but for me, it's like four onwards when this series just clicked. And I got now I see why people talk like the moment they embrace Tom Cruise, just again, saying what you want about the man, like his commitment to action to stunts for the sake of cinema and they committed to like that aspect of it like full onward i've just been blown away by this fucking franchise yeah i guess when you don't believe in psychiatric medicine you can do whatever you want um hang on to the side of the plane yeah that's that's the last dig i promise um i'm i'm similar um i like years before Ghost Protocol came out. I watched I, I watched the first one. Uh, you know, the Netflix DVDs through the mail. I did that. And mm-hmm. uh I got halfway through the first movie and I thought this is fucking stupid and I turned it off. <laughs> I didn't like it. I was like, this is boring. I don't know who this is. I don't get what's going on. I, I, I don't want to watch this anymore. So <laughs> years go by and um I see the trailer for Ghost Protocol, and I'm thinking, like, Jesus Christ, they're still making these. <laughs> who's wh- why <laughs> and um i ended up uh my mom convinced me to go see it or i convinced her somebody somehow we ended up seeing it because we're both f- big fans of simon Pegg. so i was mm-hmm. like i like him you know tom wilkinson was in the trailer maybe this will be good i got nothing else going on today and uh fucking loved it ghost protocol was was fantastic i was like this is a badass action movie and from there, I went and Netflix DVD'd again the first three movies. Watched one and two. Didn't like them at all. Again. <laughs> but <laughs> soldiered on. I watched three, and I didn't like three either. But I loved Hoffman's performance. He That's one of the scariest fucking movie characters ever. Owen Davian in Mission Impossible 3. He is an unhinged psychopath capable of anything it's a psychopath but Hoffman plays it so understated which makes it more terrifying well he's like he doesn't even care like 
there's nothing personal against Ethan. It's very much just like, who are you and why are you bothering me? Mm -hmm. Like, get out of my business, which is yeah. such a an interesting stance to take, especially in this franchise, which has like all the villains are pretty personal to Ethan. And then in this movie, he just it's just wrong place, wrong time. And Davian is so like capable of anything and willing to cross any line if you fuck with his business. Mm -hmm. On paper, it's such a bare bones generic villain, but Hoffman brought his gravitas to that role and made it. He's, he's the best villain in the franchise. Oh, but, he's great. I, I loved him in three. But the movie around him is just like boring. Damn it. You could you could tell there was like a bridge happening in the third film of like, okay, we're going from what the first two are to what it will be in four. Because three had some scenes like the bridge sequence that you were like, okay, we're we're making a transition, even though we don't they may not have realized it, it may not have been like as purposeful as like Fast Five was to its franchise. Yeah. But you could tell like, okay, so maybe subconsciously they were like something needs to change because people are liking this but they're not loving it and it worked i mean you know ghost protocol brought thousands of new fans into this franchise and you know myself included and then i saw rogue nation that was like the, the airplane like stunt and the, oh. holding his breath for so long finding out he actually did that shit yeah his, yeah. his record was beat by kate winslet in avatar 2 by the way which i find funny good for her that's yeah. funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God. I read somewhere that like James Cameron's favorite subgenre of movies to make is films where he tries to drown Kate Winslet. <laughs> so he's done it twice. He's trying. <laughs> uh, dude, I'm so impressed with like of all the stunts they've done in the series, like the Halo jump and Fallout, like finding out that Tom Cruise is like, no, I'm actually doing that. I was like, Jesus Christ. That and the, uh, the helicopter scene at the end of the movie where he's actually piloting that chopper. Jesus, yeah, and then the sure a Tom Cruise movie like then like I, when the insurance company gets like the list of what he's gonna do, how the hell do they write that right sign off on that? Be like, oh yeah, of course he can jump, you know, do a halo jump or hold his breath underwater for ten minutes. He <laughs> just tells them to. He just looks at them and goes, "Show me the money." And they go, "Okay." <laughs> he just like, what if the guy like Tom Cruise tries that and the guy's never seen Jerry Maguire? So he's got to take another stance and he's like, do you feel the need? The need, the need for speed. <laughs> it's like, all right. All right, Tom, you can have it. He doesn't <laughs> even know that. So he's pulling like Tropic Thunder. Don't negotiate with terrorists. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I, would, I would love if that's how Tom Cruise negotiates every contract. He just quotes his movies until he gets... He gets one that the guy's seen, and the guy's just like, oh, that was cool. All right, all right, you win. You win. No, apparently Tom Cruise is too busy freaking out about um, the fact that he isn't getting a huge uh, IMAX release this upcoming weekend because of Oppenheimer and Barbie. <laughs> so I don't know if he was too worried about insurance this time. Um, uh, before we get into Dead Reckoning proper, I do just want to, like, we haven't really talked about Fallout that much, but Fallout's my favorite. Fallout was so goddamn good. It's it's probably my favorite of the new bunch. One because of the everything kind of comes together for me with the story and the action. And the biggest one for me is Hollywood's like biggest punching bag in my opinion with this actor, which is so unfair. Henry Cavill, the man himself, the Witcher, the only Witcher. Fuck you, Lesser Hemsworth. Um, should have got the coin to him. They should have. They should have respected the Cavill. Um, I was about to say respect the cocks. I remember that's something that Tom Cruise said. I think in uh, what was it, Magnolia? Came the cunt. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Frank I saw T.J. Mackey, greatest role he's ever done. Yeah. I saw that clip, and I'm like, he didn't just say that in the movie. Oh my god! I watched that clip in film class. I don't remember the context, like why that Professor McClancy showed us that. But w watching the respect the cock speech in a classroom in an accredited university is a is a moment. I'll, look, I wish. Look, as much as I'm glad he's committed to like the Mission Impossible franchise, I wish he would do things like that in Tropic Thunder because when he commits to an outrageous character, he's great. He is. He's a fantastic character actor, but he, you know, he makes billions with you know nonsense action, so he doesn't really need to. I mean, he doesn't need to do anything anymore. He's like, you know, he's he's king of Planet Xenu or whatever the fuck. He doesn't need yeah. to do any of this shit. Right. So if anything, when he does those films, it's it's more of like, oh, he wants to. So this should be fun. 
Um, but yeah, no, but uh, Henry Cavill as like the villain in Fallout. Oh my god, like obviously, anyone who doesn't know that's where the meme of him doing the cocking his arms like a fucking shotgun comes yeah. from because that's how it looks. I'm like, how the fuck? I, I read into like where that came from. It was like the seventh or eighth take, and his arms were tired, and he just did that to kind of like shake his arms up a bit. And they did the, the take with that, and then on the next take, he didn't do it, and Macquarie yelled cut. He's like, Henry, why don't you do that thing? He's like, what? With the arms? Like, yeah, that was cool. Do, do that. <laughs> so it just ended up part of the movie because his arms were tired. <laughs> and it's like the the best fucking shot in the trailer. It's such a cool moment. Like, Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my it is a really thing, cool moment. Yeah, it is awesome. I've never seen that before or since. Uh, my favorite thing about Fallout is it is so fucking predictable. Like, you know he's the bad guy, obviously. Like, you know it's gonna like mm-hmm. how this is gonna go down. It's you can call every fucking moment of that movie, but the journey is so damn entertaining. That's what they've to me succeeded so well with this franchise for the most part. Is that like I'm not gonna say, like look, none of these films are fucking like, oh my god, like. Once you've seen like the first, you're like, I have an idea of where this is all going. Um, yeah, but much but like they, Ethan Hunt, we have chosen this mission. Yes, we we chose to accept the mission. And um, the point is, they they make the journey so entertaining that it's like, again, it's like what I've talked about before with like, there's no original ideals in Hollywood. Like, if you make your movie entertaining, it can be something where I'm sitting going like, yeah, it's predictable, but I had a hell of a good time. You know, same yeah. thing with this new one, predictable, but I had a hell of a good time watching it. Yeah. Above all, you know, film should be entertaining. You know, how you get there is completely up to you as the screenwriter and the director and the actors and cinematographer. It's, you know, collectively your job to make something that people are going to want to sit there and stare at for two and a half hours. Yes. (laughs) That's the goal. And not everybody accomplishes that goal. But, you know, and yeah, but you're going to hit some familiar story beats. You know, sometimes you need that to keep people invested. So they're like, oh, it's that kind of movie. So they just have that subconsciously in their head. But, you know, I'd rather watch something familiar and fun than new and shitty. Yes. Yeah. No, it, like I so said, like, you can predict the beats in this, in, in this new one. It's not like there were any, especially Mission Impossible standards with the, you know, the face reveals and all that stuff. Because it's, it's ridiculous how many, like, face masks they have throughout this series. <laughs> I love that they never address, like, the height or weight of the person they're impersonating. That never comes up. Like, in the third movie, when Tom Cruise puts on a Philip Seymour Hoffman mask, suddenly he just looks like Philip Seymour Hoffman, an actor who's got a good 100 pounds on Tom Cruise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, it's it's hilarious, man! In this new one, when Haley Otwell puts on the one from Vanessa Kirby, I'm like, these women do look different. I know they're both very attractive, you know, skinny women, but they do look different. Besides just the face, I love that Vanessa Kirby's like partner or like butler or whatever the hell he was had a had a gut feeling that something was up and just didn't say something the entire time. Just looked Not at her at like, all. why are you acting so out of character, madam, who I trust and know explicitly? <laughs> like, but yeah, I did, I was kind of confused with that. I was like, is he like, is he a is he a security guard? Is he like a a, a, a sexual sex boy or whatever you want to call it, a plaything, if you will? Like, what what is he to her? The official term is sexual sex boy. I feel like you made that up, but I like it. <laughs> it you you just coined it. That's what we're gonna call it from now on. Sexual so are sex you two like dating or is he just a sexual sex boy? <laughs> but Jamie, hey, look, it's Vanessa Kirby. So if that was Kirby, so if that was the case, get on in. Yeah. Uh okay. All right. We yeah, we talked about the franchise enough. We like, you know, it for me, it's four for four for seven. That's pretty good. Yeah. And look, again, unlike some other franchises that have seen a downgrade. Look at E-Mission Impossible, or was it Fast and Furious? There you go. Jesus, there's been so many goddamn summer movies. I was about to be like, that's an interesting out-of-nowhere pivot. I wasn't expecting that. Twist. <laughs> I hate this film. No. <laughs> this franchise may be great, but it sucked. Yeah, no, but like looking at like <laughs> Fast and Furious that has had a downgrade since Paul Walker died, in my opinion. It's been kind of limping along. Um, this one has gotten better since like it's just constantly gone up 
and up. And I'm like, like I said, ever since they lean into Tom Cruise just being like, what can I do that is dangerous but looks totally awesome on film? Like ever since they came into of that, it's been great. And apparently the the scene when he like went off the cliff that we see in the trailer like twenty thousand times, they filmed that first because if he died, then they could have at least like continued the movie. Or they would have known if they could continue the movie or not. I would love, I mean, I wouldn't love if he died, but I would find it hilarious if, it, you know, they filmed it, it went wrong, Cruz perished, and then they still made Mission Impossible 7, but like Ethan Hunt dies a ridiculous death in the first five minutes of the movie. <laughs> they just keep going. <laughs> God. Because the whole time you'd be thinking like, well, clearly Ethan's not dead. He's going to like mask, you know, he's going to be wearing a mask at some point in the movie. And you're just going to be waiting for that for two and a half hours. And it's never going to come. I don't want that. No. Uh, Okay. Dead Reckoning. Part one. Our villain is an inexplicable, out of nowhere, artificial intelligence created by God knows who that is sentient, absorbed the world's collective intelligence networks, and is holding the entire world basically hostage. And... Skynet. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> it's fucking Ethan Hunt versus Skynet. Which is neat. I mean, I wasn't like, oh, I wasn't like, oh, this is fucking stupid. I was more like, hmm. It it, oh. it keeps it fresh and interesting. I mean, look, at the end of the day, this is a this is based in what was originally a spy thriller type of film. So, like, it makes sense to go there because... Well, a lot of people forget, this was a, a pretty successful TV show for, like, 10 years in the 60s. Mission Impossible. Dun, 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 dun. It was ridiculous. It was, you know, people wearing very lifelike masks and, you know, Peter Graves choosing to accept the mission. It turned into this crazy ass over the top global action franchise somehow. And after you, you know, after you fight, let's go, let's go through it. After you fight Rogue IMF agent twice, <laughs> then arms dealer then russians then evil imf then superman ai is kind of the only place you can go (laughs) yeah and honestly it's kind of funny because when they they do ai at the same time that the you know one of the biggest sticking points that the actors and writers on strike is over ai so it's kind of funny that like that's why we're about we're having a Hollywood shut down and the new Mission Impossible is about AI and the ramifications if we allow it to take over everything. You know what's really weird? Mission Impossible did a chase through Rome better than Fast X, and it did a train fight better than Indiana Jones. I wonder if that was on purpose or a huge ass coincidence. I hope a coincidence. I hope like they watch the extraction films. I know I've mentioned them a couple times since so I've watched them, and they're like, huh, one take. Watch what we can do at part two. <laughs> I um, do love, I feel like Tom Cruise is watching the dailies of every film that com- that's gonna come out. He just wanders onto sets and just watches because he's Tom Cruise. No one tells Tom Cruise to leave. Yeah, no, he yells at and, you. Yeah, and he has a notebook and he's like, All right, chase through Rome. We can do that. Let's not do the big circle bomb. That's fucking stupid. But let's do, let's do that. All right. Oh, Indiana Jones. Oh, train fight. I don't have. I don't need CGI to look young. <laughs> I'm Tom Cruise. But we can do that. No, I won't do Nazis. But I don't know. Well, I trained the blood of children. I'm young forever. <laughs> I wish I. I want to do like the <laughs> like the Tom Cruise laugh. I can't do it. But like psychotic Tom Cruise laugh from that Scientology I, tape. <laughs> I want Tom Cruise, like, in the next home to make fun of his couch moment on Oprah and, like, Halo Trump in part two to the couch. But somehow it has to do with Mission Impossible. I hope the villain of Mission Impossible 8 is, like, God himself. And he comes down and Tom Cruise, like, is, you know, he can't, Ethan Hunt can't do it. And then this, like, fat old dude in a sea captain's hat gives him Dianetics and Tom Cruise finds the answer. He's like, this is how I defeat the bad guy. This is how I save the world. <laughs> I am so surprised he hasn't done that shit yet. I got. Or did you know? It's actually it's funny you talk about like the de aging thing. Not Tom Cruise. Um, 
apparently Christopher McCrory did reveal they considered doing de aging Tom Cruise for the opening of the film. When you see the flashback of you know his lover getting killed, um, they considered it. And in his words, he kind of sounded cocky, and I was like, I don't believe you on this one. But his, I think we perfected how to do it. It would have looked really cool. And I'm like, yeah, every other director has said that, and it looks never really looks that right. I do um, love that. But, yeah. <laughs> I like the idea that, like I like the idea that was this introduced in the other movies where like the IMF are like criminals who are given the the chance to save the world or go to prison? I don't think so. I think this is the first time we actually found that like I mean, yeah, they always get told your mission should you choose to accept it, but I'm always assuming they're good guys. They always accept these missions. So apparently they can go, no. <laughs> We've never I would love to see that. Like we get the opening narration of like you know there is a bomb somewhere in the Vatican, and you we would need you to dress as the Pope, and it's the only way for to save Rome. Should you choose to accept, and then Ethan's like, nah, just folds the envelope and leaves, <laughs> and then a different movie happens. <laughs> and that is how Ethan Hunt made Scientology. He let the Vatican blow up. <laughs> Uh, um, oh, yeah. So this AI, would, hmm? it, would, it would be me. There would be someone like me. And it's like, if you choose, oh, good, I have a choice. No, nah, no, nah, I'm going to go play God of War. It just came out this weekend. It's also interesting how in the other movies, the IMF has like, you know, a building, an office. Like there's, it's, it's like a branch of the government. In this movie, it's like three people and a laptop. They've done that in like a lot of the recent ones where like he is always in some dingy, building and i'm like i remember in the first couple films he had like an office and then i love the line this one goes this is what it is this is i'm I'm like not a good selling point that looks shitty it's like it's all so i think in just rogue nation and fallout i think those are the only two movies where he wasn't disavowed and like being chased by his own people he is like disavowed all the time. Every single movie. It's like it's lost all at the punch. It's like, oh my God, they betrayed him. Of course they did. This is like the sixth time that's happened. Yeah. Like in this one, Why they're like, he, where is his loyalty to these fuckers come from? Yeah. Like in this in this new one, when they're like, they're going to hunt you down if you look for this. I'm like, yeah, they do that every time. He's always getting hunted down by his own government. I kind of like the like the banalness in his eyes when he when he hears that. Ethan's just like, and <laughs> of course. <laughs> Yeah, not my first rodeo, dude. I'm expecting that part. I do find it interesting that they like they fake killed and real killed uh, Rebecca Ferguson in the same movie. I know. I was like, oh, I, I'm not gonna lie. It it worked. I, well, it didn't work the first time. Some other thing. Like, there was no way she got killed off like that unceremoniously. And sure enough, she was like, oh, okay. And then yeah, when they kill off, I was like, oh shit, they actually are going to kill off. Okay. I. I'm assuming we're going to get more backstory on like who Ethan was before the IMF and his relationship with Gabriel. Cause that was kind of really vague. Very vague. I'm assuming Gabriel was like a bond villain. He's like, he's doing everything, but stroking the cat. <laughs> he's like, good evening, Mr. Hunt. I'm assuming you're wondering why I led you here today. Like it's, it's a little hammy. <laughs> a little. <laughs> I mean, he sells it, but yes. Uh, I love the opening scene where, like, in the office, all of the American, like, heads of various, you know, agencies are just discussing this AI. Like, it's not a groundbreaking moment in science. Like, they're just like, oh, well, what if, what does it want? Yeah, How do we yeah. control it? When and then Kurt, in the background, you just see a guy with a very distinctive haircut, not Ethan Hunt at all, just walking in there and, like, staring everybody down. Not great. Not great uh, stealth there. No, and I was like, no one's weirded out by this guy. All, all, the, all this being led by Curie Ools, who I'm like, oh, if he's in this film, he's gonna be a dick. He's gonna be a terrible human being. He always, he seems to just hone in on that role now. There is an episode of The Simpsons where Homer uh, tried to buy dinner for his family, and his credit card wasn't working. And like they told him, and the credit card machine was just beeping and going, "Deadbeat, deadbeat, deadbeat." When I saw Carrie Ulwiz, I was thinking of that and just thinking, turncoat, turncoat. Yep. <laughs> like, like, it's not even... And then later on, it's like the most 
kind of useless scene where he's like, I am the only one telling the fucking bad guy who control like who's being controlled by the AI that you are the only one who can find it. Yeah. How do you get to the head of the CIA and not understand what leverage is? Oh yeah. Oh, when they revealed him as like the 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 one I was like, Oh yeah, of course you cast the carry Yules. Like he this is what he does. Um him and when Kittridge turned out to be like the traitor, I was like yeah, because IMF doesn't have anyone but Ethan Hunt as a good guy. It doesn't. It, it, yeah, it's Ethan, it's Ethan Hunt, Ving Rhames, and Simon Pegg are like the only fucking good eggs in this entire agency. And does anyone else ever get any other missions? Not the Shane Wingham did to hunt down Ethan Hunt. <laughs> but he's not IMF. He's like, isn't he CIA? Oh, yeah, that's right. With the, like with the biggest hard on to hunt this guy down. It, he's not very good at it. I love when he was harassing people in the airport, just poking their faces and shit. <laughs> oh, that was great. I like how he has a moment of finally helping him at the end, but then immediately goes back to like, I have to hunt him down. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man. He just... <laughs> I really enjoyed the uh, Benji disarming the nuke scene in the airport. I thought that was done very well. And you were starting to get, like, it gave you the sense that like, this might not they might not win this one. Oh yeah, that was that was a very intense scene. I I thought both him and Ming Rams were really shined even more so than in uh, prior movies in this. And someone made a comment. I didn't even think about it, but like there was a lot more levity into this movie than kind of like some of the more recent installments, which was really nice because I did like as they're trying to solve it, like they're not telling Ethan about it. So <laughs> I like when Ming Rams asked him the riddle. He's like, "Hey, unrelated, but can I ask you something?" I loved when they finally, like, there's like 20 seconds left and they're like, Ethan, there's a nuclear bomb. He's like, why didn't you tell me? He's like, we didn't want to bother you. He was like, no, nuclear bombs are something you always bother me with. (laughs) He was very much like, what the hell, guys? (laughs) Why why didn't you tell me this? Uh, Haley Atwell, I thought was good. She had good chemistry with Tom Cruise. Uh, Her character in the beginning was a little annoying and smug, but I liked her evolution. Yeah, I like at first I was like, okay, we can't keep playing this game where she just is not she's that thick and not getting it. Because like I, I you know, I get it, you know, not every character's gonna be like someone you root for throughout the whole movie. But for I was like, please just let her click on that she needs to fucking like get in on the picture and that she needs to be with Ethan Hunt because no one else is looking out for her right now. Um I did like their car chase scene um when they're handcuffed. Very fun car- Again, adding some levity when he's like trying to direct her on how to drive, and then when he's trying to when he gets the Fiat and he doesn't know how to work it. That was funny when they just get in the car and it like he slams the door unceremoniously and it's just like, uh, what do I do? <laughs> that was that was good. That was cute. Uh so the beginning with the Russian like sub disaster. So. Did the Russians build this thing or like, did they build how to destroy it? Like I was kind of unclear on that. It looked like they built it, but I, they don't really explain that in the film. I'm wondering if that's going to be reserved for like part two of how this thing actually got built. I, what I would do to make it like a franchise, you know, ending is I would have the AI be comprised of the like brain activity of every enemy he's fought in the whole franchise. That'd be interesting. John Voigt, Doug Ray Scott, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Michael Nick Vist, uh, Sean Harris, and Henry Cavill. All of those was, brains in that AI. I always forget it's Doug Ray Scott in the second film. Everyone forgot Doug Ray Scott. <laughs> no offense. Talk about a very forgettable actor. I'm almost there right now. I, I see him and stuff. I'm like, oh, yeah. And then as soon as it's over, I'm like, he was in that? <laughs> I think he was like very close to being Wolverine, mm-hmm. but Russell Crowe said no and said, "Hey, I got this this bloke and and back in Oz, it might might be what you're looking for." And that was Hugh Jackman. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, yeah, he, forgettable actor. I always forget a villain for part two. Um. That would be that'd be a cool take. They look, they they definitely left lots of open 
for like what the sequel with that said i do want to quick because this has been oddly the year of like split fucking films in fast x and across the spider verse and now dead reckoning part one this one to me shockingly enough handled its part one affair the absolute best um most because they told a complete story yes they left things in england for you know part two but in, nothing that made me go like, oh man, I gotta wait. Like fast sex, I'm starting going like, you're really gonna make me two years to know that Vin Diesel survived the damn explosion because of the power of family. Are you fucking serious right now? <laughs> like, or even like across my river, I thought it was solid, but leaves you with the massive cliffhanger of like he's stuck in another dimension. Well, let's hope he gets saved. <laughs> like, holy shit. My my concern though, and it's not a big concern, but it is I. I am thinking about it. What I wonder what's going to be different in Dead Reckoning Part Two that's going to make it stand out as its own movie as well. Like, because all they got to do is go get that sub and put the key in. How do you turn that into a three-hour movie? Well, hopefully it's like a two-hour film. That's the first difference. It's a shorter movie. I doubt it. They always get like a little, you know, every French at the end of every movie they pop another Viagra, just get a little longer every time. So I feel like this time, yeah, just a little bit more, just a little bit, you know. Yeah, they got to yeah. touch bottom. The last movie. Jesus, we'll we'll see. They're already hyping up the the second one with um with like the insane stunts they've already started that whole train of like wait till you see what's in part two you thought you were blown away by the stunts in part one wait till next year or when the film comes out because the actors are on strike do you remember i i I remember reading that like i'm pretty sure it was for this movie or for part two or it might have been for fallout but tom cruise wanted to literally like literally go to space and film some shit in space that's for a different movie completely where he is literally wanting to take a trip to space for the space scenes and film in space. Uh, okay. I thought that like at the end of mission impossible, like in the last movie, like Ethan hunt was going to fucking, you know, attempt re-entry. No, <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's where we were going with this. Like they got to go to the moon. Cause that's where the fucking AI is or something. Out of context saying that, <laughs> uh, no i look he's not f9 this franchise anytime soon um the only thing i did here recently was that even though this is supposed to be a send-off for his character i guess he got inspired by harrison ford and Indiana jones and it's like oh i mean i can keep making these tom 80 i'm like no tom it's fine it's fine like uh where, what do you do after ai like is mission impossible 9 gonna be like an alien invasion because I'd watch that. War of the Wards. War of the Wards, but with Ethan Hunt this time. Like, it's the same movie. Except, you know, Ethan Hawke is, like, getting his kids to safety from Martian invasion. <laughs> oh, that'd be fun. Or, like, you know, Ethan Hunt retires and becomes a sports agent. Oh, my God. He just becomes... He retires and becomes a movie producer. <laughs> <laughs> he lets himself go a bit. He loses his hair. Hair, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> explains why Dude, he's so cranky if they end mission impossible with like it being a fucking less grossman origin story i will i will become a scientologist i will i'll pay the dues i'll drink the fucking kool-aid i'll worship xenu because if he pulls that off maybe he really is a prophet <laughs> oh god he he is it me or does Tom Cruise just like look tired? If you see him in interviews and stuff now, he looks he looks like he's always tired. I, f- I feel like the age and stunts are all catching up to him. He look he looks tired until someone asks him about movies, and then he lights up and he's like, "Oh, like I saw him." Somebody asked him if he was going to see Oppenheimer or Barbie, and he's like, "Oh, well, I've got my ticket for Friday for for Oppenheimer, and then I'm going to see Barbie on Saturday. I think you got to use that as your palate cleanser." Like he was so excited. So, oh, I think yeah, he's. Yeah. Yeah, he's burned out, but like he still loves films and filmmaking, and it's still very exciting for him. And yeah, but it is weird seeing Tom Cruise finally start to age. Yeah, because we're used to him being essentially like 
young and just doing insane stunts most of our lives. He's been looking, you know, like fucking cocktail his entire career. It's 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 fairly recent where he's you know the, the bags under his eyes are starting to look a little droopier. Yeah, it's starting to all starting to slowly catch up. Age gets us all eventually, no matter how much we fight it. Um, even if you're in Scientology. Um, yeah, I. Did you see the thing where like they asked the the cast of Oprah like, oh, what do you guys think of like it opening up with Bobby and like Keelan Murphy was had the best answer that he goes, I think it's great. He's like, I it gives audiences choice and reasons to go to the cinema and like it's a beautiful thing that's happening. Yeah, they're calling it like Barbenheimer or something like that. Like, yeah, it's become, like a double feature. Some places they're doing a double feature. Yeah, it's dude. I, they're going to make a shit ton of money this weekend probably because of this. It would be nice for something too. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna it's gonna take the atom bomb and fucking Ken and Barbie to put a little juice but, back in the box let's, office. <laughs> let's be honest with the Barbie thing. It is slowly the fact that most guys are like Margot Robbie as Barbie. Okay, I can live. Yeah, I think you know I'm 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 gonna give it a chance. It's getting pretty good praise. I think Greta Gerwig might actually pull this off. I would be impressed if she did, honestly. Um, yeah, because you know it's funny before, you know, obviously the the box office take, and I'm not saying like this Mitch probably won't have legs for like weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, but everyone was like, okay, Tom Cruise is going to save the box office again, like he did with Top Gun Maverick. And I'm like, based off how it's going, like this will be a hit. Like it'll be a hit. It's Mission Impossible, but I don't think it's going to do what people assumed. It I would don't do. know. If, I don't know if we'll ever see another billion dollar box office gross at least not for a few years i think i think it'll be a big even marvel has faltered enough that that's not happening yeah what was the last i think avatar right the way of water was the last one yeah somehow somehow the one with the blue people that was boring for three hours i blame the chinese i do (laughs) (laughs) i didn't contribute to this box office on this i saw this show on disney plus and I was checking the run time. I was checking the time quite a bit. Yeah, I, w- I went and saw it because I, I I don't remember why, but I did. Uh, all right. So let's let's talk about the fun filled stunts in this film. Um, Jesus Christ. Like, look, I know the trailers kind of gave away a lot of it, but my God, the commitment to these stunts, like like I said, the the you know obviously the the parachute scene you know and seeing the behind the scenes that they had a ramp set up that they had iced to make sure that thing wouldn't you know would go and like they taped down his like his shoelaces so not i mean they went out of the way to make sure okay look we can't let you get stuck on this bike it has to go and has to go fast and apparently he had like six seconds total or else nope um looks impressive it looks good like they you see the finished film it looks really good i was impressed hot take i was more impressed by the halo jump halo jumps more the halo jump is better because i mean he's it, it's in the title not the video game people um but it's like high altitude low orbit i believe is what it stands for halo um in that case and yeah no it, that was more impressive to me but still pulling off this like this jump was cool too I just I wish the trailer hadn't hadn't taken it away from us. Like, yeah, yeah. I wish we'd gotten we hadn't seen it yet. Yeah, I think the train sequence to me is and honestly the best thing that they did. Knowing that they did a practical set, I think they had to go on max sixty miles per hour. You know, obviously it looks like it's going faster in the film, um, and that they were actually fighting on top of it, doing all the different stunts. Like, holy shit. <laughs> I did. I liked the when the train crashes and they're like climbing through the cars. I thought that was impressive. It reminded me of Uncharted. Yeah, that was cool. When they had the the fight in the in the bridge, as they're trying to like not you know do their fire on the bridge without fucking getting hit. Ooh. Yeah. I like the I like Benji's reaction to like you know Ethan misses the train so he has to go up on the mountain and Ethan's like where's the train I have to jump I don't want to jump and Benji's like well tough shit this is what we got. <laughs> Like he just yeah. finally is like, dude, we have no options. You gotta jump. Stop 
breaking my balls a jump. <laughs> I like I look look, that's another thing about ever since like four onward, when they've introduced like Minji and obviously Vin Rings and I've been with it since the first one, but I love that he brings this back because they have such good like interplay amongst each other by this point in the franchise. It's no. so good. Yeah, when when Minji loses it a bit in the car, he's like, dude, just jump, okay? We missed our window. This is the only option. You got to do it. Stop bitching. It's not even the scariest thing you've done. So fucking do it. I love that Ethan pauses for a bit. It's like I think he feels a little bad. He's like, oh, I, 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 he wants. To, he doesn't know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> I like when he gets like because it's one of those self driving cars. That little mm-hmm. scene where like he moves over and he quickly looks at that and like puts the buckle on. <laughs> Yeah, AI. Uh, yeah, that was that was impressive. I do you think um, Plum Kalmentiev is going to pop in in part two? I bet probably. I would hope so. I actually really liked her in this movie. Um, I thought I, she really did well with all the action. He's like that alleyway fight scene was really cool. Um, how they dude when the that. AI starts talking as Benji and just tells Ethan like you know you are done, like that was creepy. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I then I love how they cut back to me and like Ethan. It's not us. Can you hear me? Where the hell did Rebecca Ferguson get a samurai sword? She stole it. Remember when uh, it was Palm Clementoff's? Because she had it in the club, and then when they broke out, she grabbed that and got it out. Oh, okay. That's why all right. Palm Clementoff had the the steel pipe instead. Gotcha. Okay. All right. I, I forgot about that. There's a lot in this movie to keep in your head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the airport sequence is probably my favorite bit of the movie. Just all, everything that happens in that with, you know, Shea Wiggum and that other guy trying to find Ethan, Benji trying to defuse the bomb, uh, Ethan trying to find the buyer. And then later, uh, Grace was her name. Grace. Yeah. She steals it and he has to convince her to help him. I mean, you know, it's that whole set piece was fucking great. There was so much going on yeah. that you could really keep you could you could focus on all of it. Yeah, Chris, Christopher McCory, because he's been on since Rogue Nation. Um, yeah. he he honestly like he's been great since this franchise. Like, you know, you could argue that like I know the jokes have been made that he's the only one that can really handle Tom Cruise because if you know it's now so few directors work with Tom Cruise. But look, whatever it the reason may be, he has been a fantastic addition direction wise to this franchise. Well, this these are his projects with Tom Cruise. Jack Reacher, Edge of Tomorrow, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation, Jack Reacher, Never Go Back, The Mummy, Mission Impossible, Fallout, Top Gun, Maverick, and Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1 and Part 2. So I'd say, yeah, he he is the only one who can handle Tom Cruise. I think he is. And hey, look, I'm going to say right now, Edge of Tomorrow, underrated. I actually really like that movie. I got to watch it again. I didn't like it when I saw it. I thought I just, at the time, I was, you know, I was still on the fence about Tom Cruise. I was like, this is a, gro- a Groundhog Day ripoff that could have been done better. So I, I want to give that another chance. Oh, I, I I like I like it a lot. I thought it was a lot of fun. It is when my my crush on Emily Blunt got turned up to like 11 because of that movie. Um, Because, wow. Just wow. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really like it. It's fun. The Mummy fucking blows. God, I hate that movie. Yeah, that movie. Yeah, that's nonsense. It does have the greatest goofy scream in movie trailer history, though. So, you know, there's there's something to be proud of. All, all because they messed up the sound. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I think that about wraps it up here. <laughs> Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I give it three and a half out of five stars. I think it was really good, really exciting. Uh, go see it. You won't be disappointed. Just, you know... Pace yourself and choose your bathroom breaks carefully. Yeah, I agree. I gave it three and a half. A lot of fun. Good time. I still think probably the priority Rogue Nation and Follow be the are the more fun ones. Uh for me personally, I'll probably go back to those more. Um but really good time with this one. I, I really hope part two helps six the landing and makes this one better. And yes, if you're gonna go see it in the theaters, it's two hours, four, three minutes long. So go accordingly. Empty out your bowels beforehand if you must. You know, you know, uh, strategically know when to drink and eat your your concession stand food or the food you sneak in. I won't. I'm not calling you out. Um, 
but just be my rare that one time. And if that daunts you, well, hey, it's going to be on the cock pot or not the cock. I'm thinking of a different movie. This will be on Paramount Plus. I'm thinking of Oppenheimer. Sorry. You know what? Everything's on the cock. Fuck it. Uh, it's going to pop, it's going to end up on Paramount Plus by the end of the year anyway. So, yeah. Until this strike gets resolved, all of Hollywood is on the cock. So, get your shit figured out, Hollywood. All uh, of them are going to be hanging dong with Killian Murphy very soon. They're going to need the money. <laughs> uh that's our show uh we'll have content for you every week next week oppenheimer probably not barbie i don't know maybe we'll see how things work out but definitely oppenheimer uh take it easy mm-hmm.